So to me, organizing or community organizing is getting lots of people to come together um, who would not come together otherwise to build power to change something that they've decided they want to change. Um, and that sounds simple enough, but obviously it's not, or we'd see way more change than we want to have happen in the world. Aloha. Many of our conversations in this series spotlight solutions to public problems from public health to housing to responses to the climate emergency. What we don't talk about enough is how to move the politics to make those solutions possible to implement. And our guest today is a master in those very mechanics of change. For 30 years, he's worked as a community organizer, mainly in the areas of housing and economic justice. He's widely regarded as one of the best in the business, or maybe the anti-business. Mm -hmm. um, he's designed and led successful campaigns at all scales, from neighborhood initiatives to clean up a single derelict lot, to nationwide mobilizations for better banking regulation. And over the years and in the process, he's assembled a sort of toolkit for bringing people together who don't have resources or power and helping them win both for themselves. This is, I think, the sort of masonry work of democracy, often mm -hmm. overlooked, but without which nothing good gets built. So I'm thrilled to have with us today the indomitable community organizer, author, trainer, and even fellow podcaster, George Gale. Welcome, George. Hey, good to be here. Thank you. Um, nice to see you. Yeah. Um, I thought we might first start with a kind of definitional question mm -hmm. because I think everybody thinks they know what community organizing is, but they might not exactly. So how would you, you know, define it and differentiate it from, say, nonprofit advocacy mm. or activism? Um, so to me, organizing or community organizing is getting lots of people to come together um, who would not come together otherwise to build power to change something that they've decided they want to change. Um, and that sounds simple enough, but obviously it's not, or we'd see way more change than we want to have happen in the world. And I would compare that to like advocacy to me as a set of people. It could be you and me deciding we're going to advocate on some issue that we don't like how it is, but actually has no impact on us. And we're going to go do it on behalf of other people. Um, and then I think of, of service is more in the the realm of actually just we're not getting to the root cause of the problem right now but we are going to try to kind of alleviate the suffering that people are feeling um and that needs to be done but it, the, those that's the way i think of organizing advocacy and service um and how did you how did you become an organizer let's start kind of at the beginning and work our way forward sure uh I became an organizer because I needed service and uh, I struggled as a young person, as a young man, and ended up uh, needing to eat at a soup kitchen in Southern Indiana where I grew up. Um, and it is a very long story, but I'll, I'll give you a short version of it that I, uh, after coming a few times, I noticed that people that ate at the kitchen often pitched in and they would, you know, grab a mop and mop the floor, grab a rag, wipe off a table, take out the trash. And uh, one day I decided to do the same. I actually caught the attention of the cook in the kitchen who I later learned was not only the uh, uh, cook, but a theater director at night. And I looked pretty crazy and he was casting for the play Equus and he needed somebody to play uh, the young man that stabbed out the eyes of six horses. And he thought I would be perfect for the part. Uh, oh my and gosh, I didn't, that's, a, that's a real addition to the story. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. And then he, uh, his name was Von S. Kujanahan, and he gave me half his wage, which he made three eighty five an hour. He gave me half of it to come in and rehearse with him while chopping up salads and making lentil soup. We had thousands of pounds of government lentils uh, there. And um, all, all to say is fast forward three years later, I had a legit job at the kitchen, not half of Von S.'s salary, had gotten my life together and was very proud of what I was doing at this the community kitchen of Monroe County. And uh, one day I looked up and I was actually mopping up the floor at the end of serving a couple hundred meals. And I was like, wait a minute, like 
everybody that's out there eating is the same group that was in here with me the first day I came in and lots of new people. So yes, nobody had starved on our watch. We had kept anybody from going completely hungry. But the reason that people needed a soup kitchen in the first place remained. And I was frustrated and distraught. I went from kind of thinking I was doing the best thing in the world to asking a lot of questions. And luckily around then I found a book about organizing and started to try it um, at the kitchen. And what actually will kind of cue up what we talk about next. We didn't know what we were doing, but luckily we found somebody that did. Yeah. So how did you become kind of good at it? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Like, so some of us at the kitchen started having conversations about like, hey, we got to do something. And, and one of the big issues in the community was the lack of affordable housing. It was the highest rent, lowest wage district in the state. And there was a rising homelessness. The homeless shelters were full. A lot of people that ate at the soup kitchen were full. So we started having conversations about it. And we and so we ended up doing a few things right instinctively. We did kind of listen for what where there were issues that a lot of people cared about, and we moved people to action and gave people opportunities to take on work and show leadership. But we didn't know how to cut an issue, develop a power analysis, and put pressure on specific people. So we ended up doing rallies around the lack of affordable housing. We wrote op-eds. We had town hall meetings. But what we didn't realize was we were not we did not have a clear specific demand that we were organizing around, and we didn't have a clear person in power, a decision maker, some people would call a target, that we were applying that pressure to. So at first, it felt great. We were getting media. Lots of people were having these leadership development experiences. We were getting a lot of people to show up. But after four or five months, we we're like, wait, nothing's changing. And then luckily, I got invited to a meeting in Indianapolis about you know an hour north of, of Monroe County. And there was a guy there and he had a three piece suit on. I was totally, to be honest, very skeptical of, of the way he dressed and how formal he was. But the longer he talked, I was like, oh, I think this guy knows everything about organizing that we don't know. And so called him up later that day after I drove back home and said, hey, if you come down to Indiana, we can fill a room. We can't pay you, but we could feed you and give you enough money to fill up the tank in your car. Uh, if you'd come down and explain this organizing thing to us. And he did, and he taught us a set of things that I hope we talk about today. And it was life-changing. You could see light bulbs going off in the room, like, how come we didn't know this? But it was it was amazing. Yeah, I followed a similar trajectory. When I think back to my early years as like a college activist, we kind of jumped right from massive injustice to tactics. You know, it's sort of like apartheid in South Africa. So we'll build a shantytown or uh, military aid to a uh, right-wing government in El Salvador. So we will, you know, make a petition, but without really thinking about what the mechanics were of how the policy might be changed, um, though others had created that with South Africa and it ultimately turned out yeah. to be successful. Yeah. Um, sure. But we weren't thinking through it really carefully about how to develop a campaign to build power and to actually win. Right. Um, so I think it would be worth even, I know you do this as a trainer to people all over the country, in addition to organizing your own campaigns, but I thought it might be worth doing a very distilled version of it, you know, starting with a problem and going all, like all the steps you should take before you get to the rally or the petition. So I don't know what's a good yeah. one to. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I would just say, First, there are like some of the steps that we'll walk through are finding a widely and deeply felt issue, like an issue a lot of people care about. Uh, that That is the first step. The second- Okay, let's is, pick one. Um, okay. Um, so when I moved to Chicago, after I learned a little bit about organizing in Indiana, I moved to Chicago and I was asked to organize uh, in West Humble Park, which was a Puerto Rican, Mexican, Black, Polish neighborhood. Um, and really quickly, I found out in my early door knocking, it was like, boy, if people were divided in any way, it was along racial lines. So I needed to find an issue that was going to bring the community together. And um, the way we do it is listening. And so I went out and knocked on lots of doors and asked people, like, if you could change one thing about the neighborhood, what would it be? Um, and... Uh, and a bunch of issues popped up, you know, school was overcrowded. Um, there was a, you know, a decent amount of crime in the neighborhood. People care, potholes, different things like that. 
But a lot of people brought up two issues. One, there was a major rat infestation in the neighborhood. Um, and, and the trash cans were like had big holes. The rats had literally chewed through the trash cans. So what well, was a bit of a problem become a bigger problem when you couldn't kind of protect the trash from the rats. And then the other one was there was a vacant factory that was about a half a block in size, a city block um, that was completely dilapidated, wide open, bricks falling out onto the sidewalk. Kids would have to climb over them to get to school. Those were the tissue, two issues that came. Um, so did some more do door knocking and it was clear that like the energy was around the factory. We should have, we should do something about this factory. It's a widely and deeply felt issue. So then call a meeting of some of the people that identified the factory as the big issue on, on those door knocks. And we meet at a church basement. Everybody shows up. We start talking about the factory. But in this first meeting, this group is kind of thin. Some of the best people I wanted to show up, strongest people I met on the doors, natural leaders, ghosted and didn't show up. And those that did were great people. And they really wanted to do something about the factory. But it was like really hard to picture how this new fledgling little group was going to go up against what would be the mayor of the city of Chicago, the head of the Department of Buildings, and, you know, an absentee landlord that, as far as we could tell, lived in a gated community in Florida. So so in the middle of the meeting, I'm like, OK, what what about the rats? And luckily, in this meeting, people were like, oh, my God, the rats are horrible. We got to do something about the rats. And so we kind of downsized to the rats issue. And, and really what's key in there is we're going like, what is something we can win on? People are like, you know, we chant in protest. I believe that we will win. But to be honest, most people don't. So we have to figure out one of the key things we do in organizing is give people an experience of winning and winning early. We are basically at a war against cynicism. And that's why we try to find some winnable fights earlier on. So then the next step is we, we we're basically cutting the issue from like, we want, what do we want done on the abandoned factory? Like we want it. Well, before it was even bigger than that. It's like economic injustice and the housing crisis. Oh yeah. Generally. That's why we're constantly, you never, you can't but organize, you narrow it way, way down. You can't organize around pollution. You're organizing maybe around an incinerator or a law or a specific demand that you want to go on. We decide to focus on the rats. We end up having a thing that we do in Chicago a lot. We call it a public meeting, but it's, it's a, basically a big town hall. And you invite out the head that in Chicago we had, I didn't know, but we have the deputy commissioner of rodent control. We got out to a meeting. This was our big power play. And we, you know, 100 or so people in a room start chanting yes or no to get rat abatement in new trash cans. And we won. And then lots of people are like, wow, that worked. Like, I've never been a part of anything that worked. And then some of those stronger people I said that ghosted on the first meeting, they came up to some of the, the leaders at the meeting. I was not a leader because I'm an organizer. I help people, you know, train and prepare to, to lead, would come up and be like, hey, sorry, I didn't come to the meeting. I actually was kind of skeptical. We've had lots of talk about doing things before. It's never worked. This looks like it worked. I'm in. And so then that group with some new momentum is like, let's do something about the Bain factory now, which is where people, you know, had had a lot of heat. And then from there, we ran a campaign and I, I, I don't need to go into the details and figure out how to run a campaign first to get it boarded up, you know, then to, then to get it sold to a nonprofit and then turned into to housing in the community. Um, a, a couple of things I just want to underscore. And then I, I do want to follow up on this because I, I think it's really interesting. It's important and it it's applicable and I think this is one of your big points in trainings. It's applicable not just to this one right. problem, but it's applicable everywhere and at various scales. Right. But, you know, first of all, you, you came in with big ideas that might have been right, but listening to the community is a step, shockingly, For sure. often that's skipped, especially when yeah. it comes to low income or folks on the margins, people in prison or homeless or what have you like their needs aren't aren't really considered as well intentioned as everybody might be yeah um second is choosing something that's small and winnable also i think it's important to point out here you know you might have been able to win that some other way right you could have just gone with three people to meet with the head of rat abatement that's right and contacted the city council person or whatever or hired you know done a fundraiser and hired your own exterminator or something oh um God. But you, the way you're talking about, you're talking about wins that build community, build leadership, and ultimately build power. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, just to, since you brought that up, which I think is a great point, is like, so the difference between, let's let's say three or five people could have gone down and got action. Uh, 
five people had a speaking role at that meeting. Two people ran the sign and table. Somebody had to get the church basement reserved for us. Somebody was on refreshments. Somebody handed out, people handed out flyers to get people to the meeting and did door knocking. So like, let's say 25 people had roles in making that meeting happen and felt some ownership. And then the other 75 people were like, wait, I'm part of a community that just expressed some power together. And I actually experienced winning, which is way different than, I don't know, it's so-and-so down the block went down to the city hall and got it fixed, which then creates kind of a hero, you know, like savior thing in the community, which is the exact opposite of what we want. So, um, and, and a key principle of organizing is getting lots of people to take on work. Uh, because one, that's the only way we build enough power to get it done. And two, way more people own the victories if that's how we do it. Okay. So then you, you win on rats. Now you have kind of some leaders in a community. Now you want to go bigger. So then you've got to find like, wh who's your target? Is it the city or is it this absentee landlord? And um, in I mean, Florida, the, the factory, it started with the, you know, the first thing, like we're kind of leveling up confidence level. Um, and to be really honest, we hadn't even gotten to what we ultimately wanted done on the building. But the first thing people wanted was it like completely boarded up and secured. So kids weren't a danger or weren't tempted to go in there or anything like that. So the, the, we pressured that there's, you know, department of buildings in the city of Chicago, which is actually a huge department and, you know, third biggest city in the country pressured them to, and pressured the, the commissioner of the department of buildings to first get it completely boarded, completely secured and fenced around it. So now, this is not the most structural change in the world, but again, that's what, and this is the whole thing. Like if we can't deliver on what people want most, like why would they believe we're going to like change all of the land use laws in the city of Chicago, or we're going to win a thousand units of affordable housing. We're like scaling up people's belief that this craft and engaging in public life actually matters. So, um, and then from there, and it actually ended up being that the, the uh, in this case, the commissioner of buildings had a lot of power over this, uh, over this, and probably could have been doing something to hold the land, not probably could have been doing something to hold the landlord accountable way before. So it ended up being the right decision maker to keep pressuring. So then do you tell us about doing a power analysis around, around this person that you want? Yeah, this sure. individual that the individual or entity that you want to make some decision that they might not make on their own? Yeah, and usually we would go for a person, not an entity. Entities are it's a little uh, smushy and it's like, well, who at the entity? Oh, we're, we're pressuring. The other department always. Yeah, we could pressure <laughs> J.P. Morgan Chase or we could pressure Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, so um, really the, the four th things you want to know in terms of if you're trying to basically motivate a person with power to make different decisions than they're making right now. And first, you want to know what they have power over. Do they have power over it? Especially you want to know, do they have the power to actually execute what you want? If they don't, you're probably talking about the right person. But, you know, they might have power over other things that aren't exactly what you want, but things that would be good. They might have power over you. And if you get, you know, kind of feisty with them, they might come and, you know, I mean, this has happened. People have come really hard and very powerful people, and they've actually destroyed the local organization because they didn't think some of this through. So um, next, you want to know, who has power to move them? So let's say, just to stick with the mayor of Chicago, like maybe the governor of Illinois, because they have different resources and things that go down to cities and whatnot, has some power and plays a big role in the party, or the political party of the, you know, in their state, like has some power over the mayor. Or let's say you're going after the head of housing and urban development for the federal government, the president certainly has power over that person. So might be a big financial donor. So you want to know who has the power to move them? Because you might be, we might be pushing the, the head of the department of buildings and they're like, yeah, whatever. But then if the mayor goes, hey, enough with the whatever, these people are starting to get into my stuff. Like I need you to fix this problem over there in Humboldt Park. Like then they'll do it. So you, what do they have power over? Who has power over them? And then I think where it gets most interesting, we really want to know what motivates people to make different decisions. So the one thing would be like, what is, what is the head of the department of buildings most want in the world? Like, what are the things they most want? Or let's say, let's say they, maybe they want to be mayor or maybe they want a job in the corporate sector, or maybe there's some other, you know, kind of more glamorous position than being the head of the department of buildings and they want to move up. Um, so you want to know what they most want in the world. You also want to know what they most fear. Let's say they, they don't want bad media. 
Uh, they don't want the ma mayor mad at them, you know, those kinds of things. And then depending now we can come to them and say, hey, well, you really need to do something about this property on North Spalding. And if they don't, then we might go, well, is there something that they want that we may make it a little harder for them to get? So then, and then they're like, oh, maybe I do need to sit down with these people. Or maybe there's something they don't want, like bad media, that actually they start to get some. And basically, we're trying, we're out here having very little power, people being ignored their entire lives, trying to create a context that the person is like, I cannot ignore them anymore, because it really comes down to self-interest. It is now becoming my self-interest as this politician who doesn't care that much about your neighborhood right now. You have now made it in my self-interest to care because you're either bringing things toward me that I don't want or blocking things that I that I do. Does that make any sense? And are, yes, no, it makes a lot of sense. Are there other considerations? I mean, in terms of um, thinking of your, you know, what other allies you want to bring in or and what kind of coalition you want to bring or, or, or as an organizer, yeah. do you think it's most important to focus on your base? Oh, no, I think it's a good, I mean, so let's say, I ran a campaign once where the mayor, um, I would say was a was liberal but not progressive and didn't want to, and didn't want and, and generally wanted to be seen as doing good stuff for poor people. Um, but also didn't want to be seen as a tax and spend liberal. So they were trying to like they didn't want to do anything bold um in terms of spending, but actually really uh really wanted to be seen as a good person by the kind of social justice faith community in the in their town. And so it's like, so in that campaign, we actually tried to organize the social justice committees and those churches that leaned in that direction to support a demand around housing that was going to cost some money. We needed that coalition. So I would say this is like, coalition shouldn't be random. It's not just let's just get more. I mean, it's fine. Let's get more people together. But which coalitional partner actually might help move our strategy forward with more power? And so what worked finally back to the factory? Like what finally got it? What was the key intervention that got you from rats to it, a bigger victory? I think it was bad media, um, bad media about vulnerable children. Um, and honestly, the fact that we were putting hundreds of people in a room, and that's not normal, that we could fill the church basement with 250, 300 people actually was not normal. Uh, and so we weren't, of all the, you know, groups making some noise, we were one that was actually able to come through on the sense that we were actually somebody that was going to have to be dealt with. And that's where numbers do matter and, and help differentiate your, your campaign. So how do you scale this? Because, you know, it's one thing to organize a neighborhood in which you can individually or in a small group, you know, everyone who's knocking on the doors. Um, but if you want to try to, you know, use a strategy like this on s something much larger, like national legislation, what's the, what's sure. the secret sauce to scaling? Yeah, I mean, there are lots of, I mean, it's not easy. I don't want to act like it's easy. Um, if, if I could just recap the step. So the first step is because then I could walk through how we'd scale it. So you want to first is listening for widely and deeply felt issues like and we can listen in all kinds of ways, which we'll come back to. But you want an issue that a lot of people care about and they feel passionate about like you and you can't have one without the other widely felt. But people are like, yeah, or deeply felt, but only by seven or eight people or 700 people nationally, like it's not going to get it done. Second, like you've got to get that group together. You actually can't just be like, oh, we got the data. Now we'll go solve it. That group has to come together in some way. And then that group has to figure out, well, what do we want? What is the solution to the lack of affordable housing or to pollution or to inequality? We actually have to have a, we have to come up with a demand, you know, that and it has to be very specific. And then next, like, well, who or what body could deliver that solution? Is it the mayor? Is it the president? Is it Congress? Is it the you know, Department of Health and Human Services, you have to figure out that, then you do the power analysis. And from there, you start to see, oh, what are we usually I try to have like, two or three strategies that we think are going to move people to say yes, if you have seven or eight, I usually end up skeptical, because I think that's like, too many for you to run. And then you start to move to action. Like then you so start the multiple strategies is for contingency plans in case 
strategy A doesn't work or something starts to backfire? Uh, or Your strategy might be um, we are going to, back to the small town mayor, we're going to organize. Uh, we're going to try to land here. We might hear some good strategies for, for, let's say, affordable housing campaign at a smaller city level. I mean, it could work anywhere, but like we are going to get media that exposes uh, just how bad the housing crisis is and, and bring stories of families and everyday people into the forefront. We're going to basically humanize the issue of the lack of affordable housing in this town to one. Second, we are going to uh, organize the faith community to support us in this work. And third might be we are going to explore, I'm, I'm totally making these up, uh, uh, having somebody run in the primary against this candidate, I mean, against the mayor. Like those are, so you, and you might be doing all three. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, you could be doing them all three at once. It's it's not that you can only do one. I think I, I say seven or eight because like it's hard enough to pull off three. You start having seven or eight, you're probably not making decisions around strategy. Um, but you do all of that and then you start to build a plan of moving to action, doing events, doing whatever it is going to move you forward. But to scale, like, I mean, one way to scale would be like, using the online environment to actually figure out, okay, how are we going to listen to lots of people across the country and figure out, or, you know, or across Hawaii to figure out like, what are some widely and deeply felt issues? And so maybe we're going to use social media. Maybe we have an existing email list. You could even do listening without actually sending out a question. Some people do it. They're just tracking. Like, what am I seeing online? I have an organizer right now that works for me. That's tracking what's happening on Reddit and then going, Oh, the hottest issue, another scaling, like I ran a, a citywide campaign in Chicago. There was a thing called the Chicago foreclosure report printed out. It was really a report that existed for scam artists to scam on families that were in default, but we were using it for justice and we going through there and it's like, oh, wait a minute. There's a bunch of mortgages that are defaulting within three or four months of being made, being originated. So we are li we basically are finding a widely and deeply felt issue that nobody's going to come forward and talk about. If you knocked on somebody's door and said, what would you change about the neighborhood? They're not going to go like, I think I got ripped off on a bad loan. People feel shame around that. So you're actually kind of listening through the data. But then then you just run the same process. You figure out how you're going to bring people together, which you have to skip or you're doing advocacy. Um, you have to start to bring people to you know come to some decision around what the solution is. Let's say it's this predatory lending we want to pass a state law, we want to pass a federal law, um, we want to pass a regulation to, to regulate it. Um, to them, we're going to do all of those steps, you're going to do them together. But but one way you scale is, is, is through the online environment, you could also scale through existing community groups. <clears throat> Let's say a bunch of nonprofit social service groups decided that they were running into the same issue. Um, we'll just stay with affordable housing, like they could go, well, we're going to run a national campaign because we're running into so many clients that are being pummeled by the lack of affordable housing in this country that we actually have to, we can no longer just mop up the mess. We want to get up and figure out how to plug the leak. So what are, what's an example, just one maybe of a, of a pretty significant, you think national victory that came about in large part through this set of steps that you enumerated? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking one, it's a little old, but I'm just going to go with it because the first one that came to mind is like the Community Reinvestment Act is quite likely the biggest uh, federal policy change to come directly out of community organizing and really not being aided by any other, uh, you know, kind of sector of, of social change. And it was local neighborhood groups across the country finding that their members were being redlined. They were going in, applying for mortgages and actually being turned down, not because of their inability to pay, because of where they lived or because of their race or their age or their gender. And so this was a widely and deeply felt problem, but not one people really knew how to figure out how to attack. At the end of the day, you were gonna need a federal solution. So out of that, people started by bringing people together in local communities and organizing, going down, doing a protest at the banks, all kinds of you know fun, neat, creative stuff. Um, but, but they were not going to solve the problem. So then they went up a little further they won some stuff. Maybe they got some loans made to somebody, but the end, end of the day, it was still legal to redline. 
And so then next step, kind of escalating like we escalated up to the factory, was people figure out, oh, wait a minute. Our city puts its money in these banks. Like the banks are depositories for our money, the people's money. So we're going to pressure the city to say, hey, we're no longer going to keep our money in your banks if you are redlining people in your communities. A little more progress. You get into some more power. You got some more leverage there. People are like, all right, end of the day, it's still legal to redline. So then that group goes, okay, we're going to need federal legislation and then runs a campaign, not even still haven't gotten to like outlawing redline runs, runs a national campaign to win something that's called the home mortgage disclosure act, (coughs) which basically forced the banks to disclose publicly. Anybody can get the data who basically the race, uh, census track, age, gender, um, and income of everybody they made loans to and denied loans to. Uh, they, they kept people's private information. You know, it was, it was by census track. Then that was the data to prove that redlining was happening and that it said that banks were doing it. And then they passed the Community Reinvestment Act, which has since resulted in like six or seven trillion dollars being invested in poor communities, communities of color, communities that would have been other side, underserved otherwise. I mean, a huge swath of the country has gotten a taste of home ownership because of the Community Reinvestment Act, but it all started locally. That's incredible. Yeah. I think, you know, as as straightforward as you make the series of community organizing steps sound, relatively few nonprofits really are doing this at the national level or the local level. Um, you know, for nonprofit leaders who are interested in affecting real progressive change in their communities, like what do they need to do to be able to, you know, what do they need to be able to do in terms of staffing or investing or fundraising so that they really can start seeding some of these sorts of efforts that might accomplish, that might build power that's capable of achieving larger objectives than they might not be able to get through advocacy alone. Yeah. I think if people are feeling like really stuck, almost to some extent feeling what I was feeling that day, mopping up at the end of the day at the soup kitchen, like this can't be it. Like, I think it's figuring out how to invest in a community organizing program. And that could be either helping start if somebody wanted to go like, oh, we actually think this needs to be a separate organization, but we think it has to exist because we got to get to the root causes. And a set of us, let's say I'm making this up seven uh, service or advocacy organizations or general nonprofits, like we're going to come together and get this thing started because it's got to exist. And it's in all of our interests that it exists. Or somebody could say, we want to build it in-house. Um, and I would just say, if you're going to build it in-house, you got to figure out how that, and in either case, those people are going to get training and coaching. There is very little in our culture that really prepares people. I mean, I remember when I first learned these steps, I was just like, oh my God, I could have just suffered forever. Like this thing that a lot of people say, like, why don't people want to get along? Or how come we can never change things? Like, I never felt that again after I got trained to organize. Like, and so like, we need more people to feel that, but you got to get trained just like I was. You got to get trained on how to do this. So I would just and say- like, probably you need to experience those small victories to defeat oh, cynicism inside of your own self. Totally. And yeah, you can't skip these steps and go, oh, that stuff George was saying about you got to work on winnable stuff. Like, no, that is, I would say that is the number one secret sauce to good community organizing is t- giving people an experience of winning early and defeating defeatism, which I think is probably at a, a high point right now. Like it, it is, it is one of the secret sauces of, of the craft. Okay. So, you know, giving people wins is critical. On the other hand, you're working in some of the communities that are, and have been for the last few years in some of the communities that progressives have found most difficult um, in elections and so on, like, Yep. working class communities in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, why that demo, why do you think that demographic is so important? And, um, and what's your experience been like? Yeah, I think, uh, I, th- I would say rural communities, small towns and a lot of small cities um, uh, in many states in the country, if not every state in the country have uh, in many ways kind of both been written out of the economy um, certainly are very far from resources, um, financial, educational, all kinds of opportunity. Um, 
and more recently have kind of been written off by progressive and liberal leaning people, not across the board. And then Donald Trump's got elected. And in that election, there was a lot of reporting and a lot of photos and data of like rural people, especially rural white people, like coming to Trump. Now, we don't know how many of them were rural and all of that in terms of the photos, but it was definitely so suddenly there was intrigue in what's going on in rural America. Um, and especially like states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, places that started to swing in their politics. And it actually exacerbated this instinct to write places off. So, so then a lot of people are like, oh, I'm done with them. They're not us. They're, they're lost to us. And me and a set of organizers felt like that was actually the exact wrong reaction. And that people were struggling. They were suffering. They were trying to make meaning of what's happening in, a, in a, uh, all kinds of shifting conditions in, in, in America, um, economic, social, demographic, media, and that really what we needed to do was contest for more hearts and minds in rural communities and small towns across the country. And so I used to run an organization called People's Action, and we launched uh, uh, 10,000 person listening conversations. We went and listened to 10,000 people in rural communities um, to ask people three questions. Like basically, like I talked about earlier, what would you what do you most want changed? Um, what do you think is the solution? which was our effort to not project what, you know, somebody said, oh, I mean, we need something done about healthcare. They might not think public healthcare. I might think it's public healthcare. They might not think that's the solution. And third, like who and what do you think is responsible for what are definitely declining conditions here, which was a chance to really get a worldview and how people were making meaning of stuff. First, people loved, I mean, we learned all kinds of stuff and we have data about it and I can share all that. But the biggest reframe was nobody's ever asked me before. Like, that's what we heard over and over. Um, so we felt like we were on to something. And then we started working on the issues that came up in that listing, just through the exact same process I described. And we got in campaigns to stop factory farms, fracking pipelines that were going to tear up people's land and community, uh, opioid relief centers in some states like Medicaid expansion, all in some kind of cases, you know, more rat-like fights. Um, and we got people winning. People came together. In many cases, people came together in multiracial groups and were suddenly working with people they'd never worked with before. And in the process, people built trust and people started to be able to have hard conversations about the same issues that were being used to divide people. And in most cases, it was cathartic, like super huge breakthroughs in worldview. And sometimes it was, and sometimes it was like the whole house burned down. It didn't go well. Um, and then I'll just tell one more part of that work is we kept running into some issues that were a bridge too far for some folks and some folks that leaned right on some things were like, I love the new organization. I wear the T-shirt proudly. I pay my dues. I'm coming to the meetings. But um, the stuff around a like liberal immigration uh, platform, so that's a bridge too far for me. Um, and so we ran into a number of issues that were just a bridge too far to bring people together. And that's when we started experimenting with this thing called deep canvassing, which is a long form conversational style on the doors. These are like 15 minute conversations with people. Nobody knows that when they open the door, but there's a way we keep them engaged to see if you can help people reexamine how they think on a hot button issue like immigration. It could be immigration. It could be policing. It could be the role of government. And what's remarkable about this conversational model is like, we never debate people, we never throw facts at people, and we don't judge people. We actually remain curious about how someone came to see the world the way they do. And then I've done a ton of it. Like when you do it, like people soften. Once, once you don't start to debate and once you don't come at them like, hey, hey, that's, I can't believe you just said that. Like people start to soften. And um, we did this on immigration after this, this initial rural organizing and, and had a super high movement rate. And then we did it in the 2020 election. And researchers from uh, UC Berkeley and Yale said it was 102 times more effective than traditional election persuasion. Not two times, 102 times as effective. So, and that yeah, all that, grew out of being out and talking to folks in rural communities. I mean, this sounds like a kind of um, briefing document to national campaigns. Yeah. Um, what do, you know, to what extent does say, uh, a Biden 2024 campaign need to do in order to incorporate some of this 
methodology into their campaigns on in these critical Midwestern states? Yeah, the folks that were right there when this started, um, this deep canvassing model started out of the LGBT Center in uh, Los Angeles after a 2008 defeat around marriage equality. That oh, yeah, was, I remember reading about their efforts with that. Yeah, and they were really, you know, it, they were expecting to win that. Um, and just for context, it's the year Obama won was also this that lost in California. So people were uh, really distraught and trying to figure out what happened. And through a lot of testing experimentation came up with this deep canvas, this non-judgmental model and figure it out, it really worked. Well, I, I was meeting with the um, people that were there at the beginning the other day. And what they, they say, it's like, they are so not cynical about the world. They believe that whatever anybody believes, there's actually a logic to how they got there. Instead of experiences, how they were raised, the media environment they grew up in, who were their teachers, who were their parents, all of that. Um, so they have no big kind of hatred towards anyone, even if that person doesn't like them. I think there's a logic how they got there, but they actually are so uncynical about the world. So I think what they would say to your question is like, actually, political campaigns and the organizations that support them have got to take this deep canvassing to scale because it is proven to be more effective than almost anything else we do. But it's not easy. It's not for everybody. It takes serious training to do it, but it really it really works. And serious resources, too, I reckon. To really oh, yeah, yeah. Time. You've got to. I mean, you, you know, some people. We ran a program at People's Action in 2020, and it was partially volunteer and partially a paid program, meaning the canvassers were being paid. Um, um, and are you somewhat optimistic that some of this is happening? Yeah, no, no, I, I'm I'm optimistic that more there are more organizations trying to figure out how to engage for a broader sets of hearts and minds, and are trying to not move away from this notion of writing off people that don't see the world exactly as they do. I'm, I am optimistic about that. Last question, as we head into this presidential election season, that's going to suck up a lot of oxygen. Um, you know, in your opinion, what's a meaningful way for people to A, get involved? I guess that's the first question. But then I'm also curious your thoughts about like, how they should be how they should be consuming the news and thinking about the election as it progresses? What should we be looking for? Progressive people should, one, I would just say, stop the hand-wringing. No more hand-wringing. It's not allowed. Like, you have to change our entire stance. Like, uh, um, you know, sitting around talking about how bad the context is, how bad the candidate, all of this. Just, like, nothing good comes out of that. Just move to a stance of, if, if this is the outcome I want in this election, even if it's not the perfect outcome, what am I going to do about it? Like, you have to kind of take on an organizer and an actor mentality and figure out what you're going to do and you want to do it early you don't want to be like sending in donations that's like amazes me how many people send in donations the three days before the election send your donations now early try to get it to groups that really do work on the ground versus just run tv ads like if you're in the right place like go to a state where we're, you know if you're really worried about the federal election figure out how to go volunteer like uh figure out if you can do a phone canvas for there but like Oh, yeah, there's a lot of easy ways in, in Hawaii, for instance, to make calls in Arizona or other places. Exactly. Like figure out how to sign up and do those things. And I, I get it. I get why the hand wringing is happening. But I do that with your partner, your, you know, sibling or best friend, but spend most of your time like, what are we going to do? Like the minute somebody moves into, ah, I just go, like, what are we going to do? Because I think we're losing hours and days in the. This is horrible kind of thing. And then how about as a consumer of information? Because I, the reason I ask this is that I mm. sometimes feel like um, my eye on the tablet is drawn toward the latest outrage often that Trump might say, something really provocative. But I've started to feel that when I read that, when I click on and read that story, it's a little bit like um, picking up junk food in the checkout right. aisle at the grocery store. It's not really what I should have eaten. And it doesn't make me feel better an hour later. Right. Um, so, you know, how should people inform themselves and pay attention? What should we be watching for and at? what kind of questions are we? Be I asking? would say, like, try to consume what media you need to be like an aware, aware enough citizen. And if you want to be an actor in the political world, so to speak, like strategic, but just enough. Like, and also you have to kind of go like, 
I mean, I just don't need more evidence that the world is in tough shape. And I and I don't need more evidence that if you you don't like that Trump is a bad guy. So like or that and I don't need the dopamine rush of like seeing that he had a bad day. Like so it's mm -hmm. like what I need to do to be an aware citizen. So I actually understand, oh, this stuff with AI seems like a big deal. Maybe I should know something about it. Like um, and to be strategic, but just and then get, get out of it. Just get out of it. And, and I, I, would, I would say this is like I'm no expert, but like notice when you're becoming a dopamine junkie <laughs> with your phone and your computer and get right. out to some people like that. I would just say that. Um, OK, well, on that note, we should uh, get off of this podcast and get out into the world. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, George. Um, George was in Honolulu a little bit ago, and the sponsors that brought him are the main sponsors of the series, the Hawaii Unity Foundation, University of Hawaii at Manoa, and Kamehameha Schools, and also the Hawaii Children's Action Network brought George and his partner, Ajin Poo, to Hawaii um, a little bit ago, and we hope to have you back soon. Keep up the, um, stay not cynical, keep active, and and keep at it, and thank you so, so much. Hey, thanks for having me. It was fun. Okay. Have a great day.